Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the this third session of the inaugural uh, Philip R. Lee IHPS HSR Symposium. Uh, this is originally scheduled as an in-person event last May, but for obvious reasons, we're now moving to a virtual format. Today's presentation topic uh, is health system and community uh, embedded health services research. Uh, this topic really tries to emphasize how to link health services research, implementation research, and community-based participatory models into what we would call learning health system model. So excited to get into that topic today. I should also introduce myself. I'm Andy Auerbach. I'm a hospitalist at UCSF. I'm really glad to uh, uh, moderate this today's session with four amazing scientists who I consider really leaders in these methods. Uh, I can't introduce them as fully as I would like, so my apologies to them for the brevity of this introduction. I'm going to give them a quick, uh, for, uh, quick introduce, intro for each of them. Uh, Julia Adler Milstein is Professor of Medicine and Director of the Cl Center for Clinical Informatics and Improvement Research here. Her work focuses on policies and organizational strategies that enable effective use of electronic health records and promote interoperability of electronic functions between systems. Nemi Bardak is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Policy in the Department of Pediatrics and at IHTS. Her research focuses on improving the quality of inpatient and outpatient pediatric care with a foundation implementation and dissemination sciences. Michael Steinman is Professor of Medicine in the Division of Geriatrics at the San Francisco VA. His research focuses on identifying and improving the quality of medication prescribing in clinically complex older adults, particularly in approaches to deprescribing unnecessarily or potentially harmful medications in those patients. And finally, Janus Yazdani is Chief of the Division of Rheumatology at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, San Francisco General Hospital and the Alice Betts Endowed Professor of Medicine there. She co-directs the UCSF Rheumatology Quality and Informatics Lab, a group that uses health services research, informatics, and implementation science to inform national healthcare improvement initiatives. Again, that was far too brief for each of their amazing accomplishments. I'm gonna hand the mic over to our first speaker this morning, Dr. Adler Milstein. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, well, thank you so much for including me in this terrific panel. Um, we are, um, I think, each going to use uh, slides in a limited way. Um, and so let me just pull mine up. I um, did want to start with perhaps a bit of a broader perspective on um, uh, learning health system. Um, there's lots of ways to uh, define it and understand it, um, but I'm going to start with the way that I think about it uh, and understand it. Um, and as a way to get into sort of what does embedded learning health system research look like um, and where are there are opportunities to do that. Uh, as Andy said in his introduction, I do come at this from an informatics perspective. And so uh, my take on this will be one in which uh, the notion of sort of informatics as a platform on which to learn is, is very central uh, to the way that I see the opportunities and the examples that I'm gonna give. Um, but, but fundamentally, when we think about a learning health system, it's the notion of, of this learning health cycle uh, in which there is data available uh, that we analyze in order to generate knowledge. We then feed that knowledge back into practice or performance. Uh, and then um, uh, the whole point is that this is an ongoing cycle in which we then assess whether that new knowledge in practice is uh, improving uh, outcomes or not, this notion of performance. And then that feeds right back into this cycle again. So this is, I think, a very general uh, way of thinking about what does it mean to be a learning health system? It is one that engages uh, in this cycle uh, around you know, health problems of interest. What, when I see this cycle, um, I really see sort of the electronic health record or sort of digital health tools and platforms as, as fundamental uh, to being able to, to do this kind of work. Um, and that is because first and foremost, uh, the electronic health record is an incredible source of data. Um, and it's hard to think about research that's done today to generate new learning and knowledge uh, that's not pulling data in some way from an EHR. Um, so I think that's the obvious way that it fuels this cycle. Um, but equally important uh, is thinking about the EHR as a knowledge delivery platform. Once we have identified new knowledge, uh, we then think about how do we feed it back into the EHR because the EHR is what is in the workflow of uh, the key uh, uh, stakeholders and, and, and entities who are making decisions um, that, that impact uh, performance. So these are doctors, nurses, um, you know, ancillary care providers, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so the EHR is also a knowledge delivery platform. And perhaps the classic example is we think about, well, we have a new clinical guideline um, or an adaptation of a prior clinical guideline. And so we then go into the EHR and 
update the associated uh, alert or, uh, or sort of clinical decision support tool that's going to deliver that knowledge um, at the point in time. So again, I think it's a pretty familiar way to think about that knowledge to performance piece in terms of the informatics tools that support it. Um, but I think uh, equally important, but often uh, not, uh, uh, that doesn't receive as much attention in this cycle. And it kind of comes about as you're moving from knowledge to performance back into performance to data is that the EHR itself is actually a very powerful behavioral intervention. That the way that we uh, introduce uh, decision support alerts, where we choose to put them, how they, uh, how they are sort of uh, visually presented, right? All of those are decisions that have an incredible um, uh, sort of uh, power uh, uh, to influence behavior or not. Um, and so if we're really going to think about embedded learning health system research, we can't just think about um, uh, the knowledge that's fed into that cycle, but we actually really need to think about uh, the way that we are sort of presenting and trying to use that knowledge to influence behavior um, and really study that. Are we actually affecting the behaviors that we think we are affecting or not? Um, and so if you put uh, an alert up and it is dismissed 95% of the time, uh, we have probably broken this cycle. We have not actually achieved the intent of learning. Um, but in order to know that, you actually need to measure how often is an alert dismissed or not. And that's a measure of behavior. Um, and so, um, so the way that I uh, uh, approach, I think, thinking about learning health system research is to think about how do we measure those key behaviors and understand how to use the EHR uh, as, uh, as a source of learning around promoting uh, the, the types of behaviors that, that we want uh, among our, our healthcare delivery system uh, generally and obviously specifically around the, the frontline decision makers. So that's sort of a general way of, of thinking about this. And, and it's the reason I think that it's so powerful is because um, we have examples from almost every other context other than healthcare in which they've recognized that the way that you understand how to design digital environments is by studying how users are operating within them. Um, and so, um, so we think a lot about, oh, this, you know, huge transition from paper to digital, right? From going from paper bookstores uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to the first version of Amazon.com when it was launched in, in 1996. Um, but actually, I think the more powerful transition is when we think about where Amazon started to where it is today. And the way that our behaviors on a daily basis on this platform are influenced by the way that we interact with the platform and the design decisions uh, that Amazon makes about that. Um, and so again, where is their opportunity to learn? Uh, it's really this opportunity to learn uh, how to uh, design digital environments uh, to, uh, to sort of promote um, the behaviors and outcomes that we want. So obviously in Amazon's case, it's pretty simple. <laughs> you know, they are studying user behavior on their platform, like, you know, every moment of every day, uh, they look at what you put in your cart and then they look at what you buy. Um, and they essentially learn uh, uh, about how to change the design of, of their website based on that. I think that there is a direct, albeit more complicated parallel in the learning health system context, uh, where we think about how do we measure and monitor the behaviors that are going on in our health system? How are our uh, you know, clinicians uh, interacting with EHR data? How are they um, you know, sort of absorbing uh, uh, all the information that we are sending at them. How are they reacting to clinical decision uh, support alerts, et cetera? Um, we then understand, you know, what care decisions they make because of it, and then the outcomes that patients experience. So when I think about the learning health system, to me, this is the model um, that, that health systems should be using and adopting to really understand and learn about, um, you know, how, how to make that learning health system cycle work. Uh, the reason I think it's so powerful in terms of the opportunities for learning is because Amazon essentially controls their user interface design, one thing. <laughs> um, it's a very powerful thing, but like fundamentally that's what they can tweak and, and they tweak it very effectively. Um, but a health system actually controls a much broader range of tools. They can not only change the look and feel of their EHR, which is you know, uh, complicated, but, but, not, but, but still doable, but they can change pathways and protocols, the way that clinical teams are structured, workflow, and even up through education and training. So if we can really learn about uh, what, what works in terms of uh, designing and delivering interventions through the EHR, we then can use this broad array of tools to, uh, to continue to, uh, to, to improve that. Um, so all of this is really enabled by the recognition that we, we are today capturing 
data on how uh, our, our frontline users are interacting with the EHR. We are actually observing and measuring that in the same way we're seeing what medications are patients taking or what are their diagnoses. The same EHR platform that captures all the clinical data is, is also capturing all of this different user data. Um, and I think most people aren't even aware that it's there to be integrated into learning health system research. Um, and so the research center I run is, is very much designed around the opportunities that are afforded by using these data to understand how clinicians are interacting uh, with the electronic health record, um, and then being able to tie that to what care decisions are made and what outcomes patients experience. Um, and I think that this opens up a whole front for learning uh, that we've never had before. And so as we have pursued this work at UCSF, uh, we have started to see all of the different um, ways in which it can contribute to, to learning within our health system. Um, and so I just want to uh, spend the rest of my time giving you some concrete examples of, of what this looks like. So the first is, um, uh, is an example of, uh, of just, it wasn't even an opportunity and an identified opportunity for learning. Um, this was just a routine upgrade that was made to our EHR um, as part of what the vendor was, was naturally planning to do is just packaged in with probably 10 or 15 other updates that came. Um, and it was a really simple user interface uh, design change um, in which uh, data that came from systems outside of UCSF um, were presented on a different screen than they were before and a screen that sort of was more central uh, to where clinicians might naturally find it. Um, and, and so um, again, you know, the plan was just to roll out this change and keep going forward. But what we saw is this is a really powerful opportunity to understand um, how often uh, um, are our clinicians looking at this outside data? And when you put it in a more obvious place, does it actually increase how often uh, those data are looked at as part of, of routine clinical care? Um, and I think you don't need to be a, a, an expert in stats to be able to tell from this graph uh, that there was a, a significant increase uh, in week 27, which is when this user interface design went into place. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we were able to measure that how often uh, these outside records were viewed by our frontline clinical staff increased by almost 30,000 per week, right? A dramatic change in behavior. So there is an opportunity, uh, again, no one even really thought about it as such, uh, an opportunity to learn about the power of putting information in a more central and logical place in a way when a clinician might more naturally uh, see it and encounter it and that they actually in turn led them to, to review these outside records more often. Clearly we need to also study, did it change their decisions? Did it change patient outcomes? This is only the first step. But again, this was actually a relatively easy thing to look at and run and something that sort of, if you hadn't approached this with a learning framework, we might never have found the opportunity to, to do. So I'm just gonna give one more quick example uh, before I finish my time. So this is an example of sort of a researcher coming to uh, a health system and saying, oh, you're missing an opportunity to learn. Um, and so let, let me uh, you know, do some research uh, built around you know, your normal operations uh, that, that can lead to learning. We're also seeing uh, the flip, which is the health system coming to us to say, we need to better understand the impact of the changes that we are making um, and, uh, and so how can you use the data that you uh, are an expert in around how clinicians are interacting with the EHR uh, to help us do that? Um, so the example I wanna give here um, is, uh, is that we launched a new navigator within our EHR uh, that helps support clinicians in doing advanced care planning. Um, so these are advanced directives and sort of other really important documents. Um, and so this navigator was launched and the hope was that people would use it uh, as a basis for documenting uh, the decisions and conversations uh, that they're having with patients. Um, but there was no way to know sort of how often people were using this navigator or once there was information populated in it, how often people were looking at it. So our, it's you know, very little value in having an advanced directive if then that advanced directive is not viewed <laughs> later on. Um, so they came to our team to essentially say, help us build some of the, um, the tools to measure how often this advanced care planning navigator is used um, and how often the data is viewed um, and has resulted in just yesterday, uh, a presentation um, in which we identified lower rates of use for our Latinx population compared to others. Um, and so we're now trying to figure out like, why, why are we not um, you know, able to, to improve uh, the use in that particular community? Um, and, uh, and how do we you know, address that gap? So I hope those are sort of concrete examples of where there's been opportunity to do sort of both pull and push learning 
um, when you see the EHR as a way to measure behaviors and behaviors that are essentially um, uh, critical uh, to, to ultimately improving outcomes. Um, and I hope that that's a, a way that we can shift to think about embedded learning health system research uh, and use really the full set of data that are available in EHRs uh, to understand uh, the optimal way to, to go about the learning health cycle. Just encourage people to use the Q&A or the chat, I suppose, if you've got questions for our speakers as we go along. And we'll also try to save a couple to the end, but I'll make sure we get to our next, next speaker, uh, Dr. Bardak, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, I think this is a nice combination with with um, Julia's presentation because um, uh, it's they're both focusing on some form of data that we could access in order to help um, feed the learning healthcare system. Um, Julia's focus was on EHR data. My focus is actually on observations of um, care from family uh, families and patients. So uh, focusing on the learning healthcare system, the project I'll, I'm gonna be talking to you guys about as an illustration of that is Family Input for Quality and Safety, also known as the FIX um, project. And um, we know patient safety issues persist, you know, since To Air as Human came out more than 20 years ago, we've been trying to work on patient safety, still a problem as of 2013, still a problem as of 2021. We know that the um, patients and family members in the room are often the closest observers of patient care. So there's data from Yelp, from HCAPS and Facebook that all show that the um, ratings that people put onto those sites are associated higher ratings, lower um, uh, outcomes such as mortality, such as readmissions. Um, it, uh, the, it's a pretty consistent um, set of findings. And then more specifically, um, there's a study done uh, by Daniels et al. and Weissman et al. showing that families and uh, patients and families when reporting safety events capture more adverse events as confirmed by staff than our incident reporting system, right? So our safety reporting system, the incident reporting system, just we know it's not a, a highly sensitive system. So um, uh, only two and a half percent of the things that were identified um, as safety complaints uh, were also um, uh, were identified by the clinicians in the system. So what's our challenge? We know that patients and families see things, but we're not always capturing that information. We have a delay in the system, even in our HCAP system or Prescani system, we have a delay in the system for getting any observations um, back and almost, uh, almost nobody leaves actual sort of written text in those uh, surveys. Uh, so we have very limited details about what happened. Um, and so the hypothesis is that with better safety information, um, we could potentially improve patient care more rapidly. So the opportunity is um, there's a this this work builds on our R21 that that um, uh, supported an earlier study in hospitalized children using mobile phone technology to gather information from patients and family members, uh, which included text messages sent at 2 p.m. each day using a mobile responsive website. The information was then made available to members of the healthcare team in order to improve patient care. So that's the learning healthcare system piece we powered by um, family and patient observations, and it was discussed at team huddles. And these are just some visuals for you to be able to see. This is what somebody got when they were part of the, uh, as a text message at 2 p.m. Um, there's a splash screen making sure that people understood that it, it couldn't be used for emergency purposes um, and also uh, that it would be um, an anonymous system. And we, we can talk about the pros and cons of the anonymity in a bit. Um, this is the next screen. And then people got a very specific set of, you know, categories, helping people to categorize what, what, what does it mean to, to um, uh, think about safety? What are the categories we might want to use? We walked them through this when we enrolled uh, patients so they could get a shared conceptual um, sort of framing in their brain. And then there's subcategories that were based on uh, literature reviews about what subcategories might be um, observable by patients and meaningful and actionable for clinicians um, or for uh, safety efforts. Um, and we reviewed all this with the Family Advisory Council. So getting um, input, uh, of course, from family members and building this kind of tool is quite important for doing co-design. And then we had a specific section on um, uh, that allowed for free text details. We got pretty rich information actually from almost every data entry. Um, so this piece was actually a, an important component. Um, the one other thing to highlight these, so it was over the course of about six months, we had safety events, um, about 122 safety events, not a huge volume. People were a little bit worried at the beginning, oh my God, what if we get tons? Um, 
the what went well category is an important one to sort of highlight for two reasons. It was something that came up when we were doing our co-design process. We did not have the what went well. We did some usability testing on the unit um, in the med surge uh, unit where we were doing the project. And people said, hey, can we say what's going well in addition? Those comments, you can see there's actually a fair number of comments, 30 out of the 122. Um, they were really helpful for when we would review them in the safety huddle. It would help people psychologically, sort of if there was a comment that was saying that was, you know, a constructive slash critical comment, it was also really nice. At least um, every time we did it, there was at least one comment that was also a, a, a you know, appreciation, um, which I think helps psychologically with people as we do this work together as part of the learning healthcare system is actually, it's good to also, uh, not just for psychological, like, oh, rah, rah, yeah, that sounds good, but also directionality that people should be able to hear what is it that is working well that we should maintain as well as anything that needs to get fixed. So, um, so I think that was a, it was a useful insight for us. Um, our next iteration is now an R01 that is uh, underway. Um, it adds other populations and settings, including the newborn nursery, the um, pediatric intensive care unit, the hematology, oncology, and BMT units, all at um, UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, San Francisco. And then we're also um, uh, implementing it at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital in the pediatric um, med surge unit, as well as on the newborn unit. Um, which includes neonatal, the uh, neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit, and we're including a pilot in adults. Um, we're doing a couple tool modifications. We'll do it in English and Spanish because we didn't have Spanish in the first version. Um, we're going to add an option for a patient to be contacted by the care team if they're comfortable. So I'm going to take an extra minute to talk about anonymity. We made a decision in partnership with the Family Advisory Council in the first iteration to make things anonymous. All of the comments put in guaranteed anonymity to the care team. We, could, we on the back end could see it, the research team could see it, so we could link it to the EHR as long as somebody had signed a, a HIPAA consent. Um, but nobody on, the, nobody on the care team would know who had made any given comment. The strength of that is that it allows people to feel less worried about um, having their care change, it'll, it, generally speaking, we felt like, including the Family Advisory Council, we all felt like it would encourage people to participate. Um, the downside is that it's harder to go back and ask questions about what might have happened. So we, we weren't gonna go back and query anybody and get more details to understand things. And then also it meant that people couldn't do service recovery. So there were definitely some people who were like, when we went over it in the huddle, there was some of the nurses and some of the physicians said, I'd really like to go back and talk to that person and, you know, help make it, make things right. Um, uh, or explain and clarify something to help them out. Um, the, the literature, there's an interesting paper that came out from BMJ Quality and Safety by Kaveh Shajania, which actually pointed out that in a system where they did allow for non-anonymous comments is that there ended up being a lot of energy spent on service recovery and not on systems learning because people got a little bit distracted by the service recovery piece. So this anonymity piece is a really important piece. How do we, how, how does it interact with whether a patient engages and how does it meet, how does it drive what we do as an organization? Um, so our decision in this round is we'll let people at the end sort of say, yes, I wanna be contacted so that we have an opportunity to be able to go back to them, but it'll still sort of be a default an anonymous um, uh, comment and we will try and focus energies on system level changes rather than, um, uh, rather than um, service recovery. Uh, we're also gonna be adding experiences of racism or bias in our communication section, because it's an important piece. And we were in the first uh, iteration, there was actually uh, much lower participation with Latinx patients. And so we wanna figure out if there's something else going on there. Um, and then we're adding an infection prevention category that hadn't been in the first iteration for a variety of reasons. Um, and finally, the in this iteration, we're actually gonna um, set up a learning collaborative across all of the participating units, um, including fa family or patients as standing members with the goal of trying to better understand how can we use these comments to create system level changes? What are the you know lessons learned across the units? What are the things that are specifically different units are trying that they feel like are successful, things that it maybe didn't work as well. Um, so uh, that that's the goal of trying to actually better understand, um, better better leverage this this potential data stream. 
I want to acknowledge a very large group of uh, fantastic uh, collaborators and co-investigators, um, a terrific study team, and then the family advisory councils at both uh, hospitals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi. It was really wonderful work, and I look forward to see when it uh, gets to publication phase. Um, and thanks for sharing it beforehand. Our, our next speaker is Dr. Steinman. Um, I'll quickly hand the mic over to him. Thank you. Great, thanks, Andy. Uh, I have some slides to present, but I'm actually going to start off just by talking without slides, and I'll save them for a little bit down the line. And sort of to follow on Naomi's example, I'm going to share an example from my own work and some of the lessons learned. And this is not a classic story of doing research closely embedded within a learning health system. It's more of a traditional model of investigator-initiated research. But I will try to articulate how we thought about practice change and try to develop this uh, model with principles of implementation science in mind. And we really did that by trying to be attentive to the concerns of the key stakeholders as we thought about them, and also in the way we approach and present the analyses that meet the information needs and facilitate behavior change among the people we were thought would be most pertinent for this research to get to. So my own background, I'm a geriatrician. My research interests are focused around improving medication prescribing quality in older adults, and I've done a lot of that work using large existing data sets. But this research came out of my own clinical experience. I was in clinic one day, or actually a series of days, this is probably about nine years ago, and I saw two patients in fairly quick succession. And they were older adults whose blood pressure was normally fine. They'd been recently hospitalized for things like pneumonia, fairly sort of self-limited conditions. But while they were in the hospital, their blood pressures went up markedly. And as a result, the inpatient team put them on several new antihypertensive medications and then sent them home with those intensified antihypertensive regimens. And so then not surprisingly, when they came to see me back in clinic about a week after discharge, their blood pressures were through the floor. And fortunately, neither one of them has suffered an adverse event, but they were kind of on the verge of happening due to their low blood pressure. So this got me thinking, and I looked, started looking in the literature and I realized there was almost nothing written about this topic, either empirically or even in the form of commentaries. So actually I connected to Andy and Andy and I had the pleasure of working together and we wrote a commentary that was published in JAMA IM we got some good feedback and encouragement. And so this led to some further work with thinking about how we could explore this uh, question empirically and had the good fortune of getting funded by from the NIA to do just that. And so the studies that resulted this were a series of studies that were done within the VA healthcare system. And this is a great system in which to do this kind of research, both because the data elements are fabulous for measuring these kinds of things. And also the VA is a national system that provides widespread opportunities for implementation. So we did this using two conditions, hypertension and diabetes is sort of model conditions for this broad phenomena of intensifying therapy for chronic diseases. In a particular for each of the diseases, we looked at the epidemiology of how often people's medication regimens were intensified in the hospital and they were sent home on more aggressive regimens for hypertension and diabetes than they came in on. And then we also looked at the outcomes of those intensifications. Now, to be clear, like I said in the beginning, this was not a problem that was solicited by the health system. It was really not on their radar screen. It frankly wasn't really on anyone's radar screen. But in thinking about what the work we were going to do, we really thought our target, target audience was hospital-based clinicians. In particular, we thought about what would be sufficiently compelling that the findings of our research would help to grab their attention and subsequently would help to change the practice to the extent to which we found, because we didn't know yet if practices were problematic. And the way we tried to approach that was by focusing on what's clinically important and clinically sensible. And part of the way that we did that was trying to identify practice that were unambiguously dumb. And in part that was involved looking at subgroups where you can say, you know, if this person got this kind of treatment, that was kind of, not many clinicians would think that was a good idea. And we can use that as a window on the larger phenomena, even for patients where there was ambiguity that would give us some insight as to what was going on and how the practices were, were playing out. Another part that we tried to bake in from the very beginning was thinking about leverage points that were driving these practices. If we could identify the kind of things that were, that were leading clinicians to intensify antihypertensives and diabetes medications potentially inappropriately, that would give us leverage points to try to improve those things later on. So we took these ideas, we thought about them ourselves, we also workshopped them with other clinician colleagues, including those who were actually working in these settings, and then we came up with our plan. And I do want to say uh, uh, you know, very prominently that a lot of this work was led by Tim Anderson, who is a fabulous research fellow in the Primary Care Research Fellowship, subsequently is now a junior faculty member in research at the Beth Israel in Boston, and he did really fabulous work with this area. So I'm going to share some slides now. All 
All right. So I'm going to just show some a representative sampling of some of our, our findings. So the first finding we had was looking at blood pressure medication intensifications. And we found that 14% of veterans who were admitted to the hospital for a reason that was not related to any kind of heart or brain issue had their blood pressure medicines intensified. That is, they were discharged from the hospital on more or more aggressive blood pressure medications than the medications they were taking at the time of admission. But this doesn't really tell us whether this is good or this is bad. So we really try to answer two key questions here. First of all, were clinicians considering outpatient blood pressure in their decisions to intensify or not intensify? And this is because, you know, as many people on this call know, hypertension is a chronic disease. What one's blood pressure is on a given day or a given week typically doesn't matter that much. It really matters one's level of control over a period of months, years, and decades. And so if clinicians were not looking back and say what the person's blood pressure had been in the year or two prior to hospitalization, then that, you know, and therefore what the, the long-term level of control is, we felt that, that was the most important clinical factor in deciding who was appropriate to intensify. The next thing we tried to look at is were intensifications more common in types of patients most likely to benefit and least common than those who were least likely to benefit. And these two questions basically can be bolted to down are, are the decisions that we're seeing playing out through the data clinically sensible or are they dumb or some combination? Oops. All right, so uh, we found that they were a little more the latter than the former. In particular, we found that decision that the, the people who had their blood pressures uh, medications intensified, this was very strongly correlated with the level of inpatient blood pressure. Your inpatient blood pressure shot up, you were much more likely to get a therapy even when you were discharged. And in contrast, there was very little association between the blood pressures that people had prior to hospitalization over the past year. Those were not really associated almost at all with the decision to intensify or not intensify as reflected in what medicines people got. Similarly, we found that rates of intensification of these blood pressure medications were similar for people with and without dementia and with and without metastatic malignancy, and also similar in people with or without ischemic heart disease and stroke. That is, the people who are most likely to be harmed by these intensifications were getting them at just the same rates as those who were least likely to be harmed. And those who were most likely to potentially benefit were not getting them any more often than people who didn't really have much of an opportunity to benefit. So the next thing we tried to look at was outcomes. Uh, these are just some, again, some more representative examples. That slide on the top left shows the rate of 30-day hospital readmissions among people who are intensified on their regimens or were sent home without intensification. And this is after using a lot of advanced statistical techniques to try to co control for differences in the group. So we found that people who were intensified had a significantly increased risk of being readmitted at 30 days compared to people who were not intensified. And then on the flip side, you know, we thought that the reason people were intensifying was to help prevent future cardiovascular harms. So we looked over the following year and where people are intensified, less likely to have things like heart attacks or strokes. And in fact, the opposite was true. People are intensified were on a borderline statistical significance, uh, just a little bit over P of 0.05, more likely to have adverse cardiovascular events rather than less likely. But again, getting back to the animating principle at how this would affect change, you know, this is for all comers. And what really matters to the clinician is, you know, what's happening about the patient in front of me. And so we, in trying to think about what was the most important driver for clinicians that we thought would be most clinically sensible to them, we thought about what about people with elevated outpatient blood pressure? That is, that's the group in whom, you know, there's probably the most clinical justification to think about intensifying therapy. Because if someone with blood pressure is high chronically over a year prior to hospitalization, one can make the argument that while they're in the hospital, it's a good time to intensify their therapy and get them on a more aggressive regimen to go home with. It's not an unambiguous argument for that. There are a lot of potential downsides, but at least there's some sensibility to that approach. And so we found that uh, when we looked at this and stratified by the level of outpatient blood pressure control, the people whose blood pressure was normal in the year prior to hospitalization, they were substantially more likely to be harmed. They had a number needed to harm of between 19 and 40 for each of our three primary outcomes, hospital readmission, serious adverse events, and cardiovascular events. In contrast, people whose outpatient blood pressure prior to hospitalization of the previous year was elevated, there's actually no significant difference between intensified and non-intensified groups for those outcomes of interest. To be clear, intensification did not help them, but it also didn't harm them. 
in contrast, we did find that the people whose blood pressures were normal were especially likely to be harmed. All right, so I'm gonna stop my share right now and just kind of conclude with some other thoughts. Oops. All right. So we take this work and we kind of just try to share it through Twitter and journals and other kind of more traditional dissemination platforms. And we were pretty happy with the results. We got a lot of interest. Is that several of the papers that came from this project got picked up by New England Journal of Medicine, Journal Watch. You know, Tim and I did some podcasts on the topic and we were really gratified that we actually got contacted by a lot of residency journal clubs who selected this article for discussion in their own journal clubs. And so that was gratifying. We felt like the message was kind of getting out there. People were being educated. People were raising, getting more aware of the potential issue. We sort of attributed that to the power of a good idea. And again, I want to give a shout out to Tim for really doing a phenomenal job in this area. You know, but there are some limitations to this approach. You know, we did not have a built-in QI plan or implementation partnerships baked in from the very beginning. And that is a limitation. Now we're doing some work moving on that. For example, Tim Anderson just submitted a grant to, de to develop an intervention pilot to address this issue. And the final thing I wanna say about this is I don't think all health services research needs to automatically be intimately baked in with the learning health system. There is a role for this research. You kind of come up with a good idea and no one's really thinking about it, but you think it's important and you advance it and kind of get it on the radar screen that way. But as we do this, we need to at least have an honest conversation with ourselves. You know, is that actually the right approach or do I really need to get those stakeholders involved from the, from the very get-go uh, to have the most impact for my research? I think it can go both ways, but we at least need to have that conversation with ourselves and with our colleagues to kind of keep ourselves honest about what's actually gonna make our research impactful and work. So with that, I'll stop there. Um, uh, and we'll move on to Dr. Yazdani. Thank you, Janus. Hey everybody, a, a pleasure to be with you and share with you some of the work that we've done uh, in the subspecialty setting, uh, which I think will uh, distinguish uh, some of what I'll talk about today with uh, this, the wonderful thoughts from the speakers that have come before. I'm going to tell you today about a journey um, that we have taken in uh, the UCSF Rheumatology Division to use principles of human-centered design to develop tools to facilitate patient-centered care and improve outcomes for rheumatoid arthritis. So many of you know that rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic autoimmune disease. It's actually pretty common. It affects about 1% of adults in, in the United States. And it causes swelling and inflammation, pain of the, of the joints. And if, if left untreated, it can result in a significant amount of disability. At the same time, uh, we've just had an amazing explosion of therapeutics. It's a really fun time to be a rheumatologist because we can really uh, help people. Um, but sometimes there's a gap between the tools that we have uh, and our ability to improve patient outcomes. And I think this is really a case where population health management um, and having a standardized approach to care is very important. And so I'm gonna just share with you uh, some of the things that we've done over the years to try to improve care uh, in our health system for, for rheumatoid arthritis. And I'll start in 2013. And this was the year that um, we, we started to you know, think about how we could actually measure outcomes in rheumatoid arthritis in our patients at, at UCSF. Um, I think it's very important for us to be able to track patient reported outcomes. So this is a disease that affects people's function. It uh, can diminish quality of life. It's associated with pain. And being able to track those things longitudinally is very important for being able to manage the disease. And at the same time, rheumatologists love to count swollen and tender joints. And we wanted the electronic health record to help us, you know, help us track um, these things over time. For example, being able to see the tender and swollen uh, joint count change as we, as we uh, change treatment. And, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, I think we were relatively naive. We wanted to change the electronic health record to you know, suit the needs that we had in taking care of RA. And the UCSF IT uh, staff is wonderful. And I think they tried really hard to help us, but they really ran up against some of the um, challenges of trying to reconfigure software that you didn't make yourself. So there was always a really long can't do list. Like, you know, they couldn't make um, 
some of these things appear in the places that the, that the clinicians wanted them to appear in the EHR. So in the beginning, we had this very clunky workflow where we use nursing flow sheets to type these outcomes um, into this flow sheet so we could track them over time. And you can just imagine that this is really annoying. It's annoying to the staff. It's disruptive to clinical care. The usability um, here was not ideal. Nevertheless, we have you know, some very motivated clinicians and we were able to, over time, um, you can see in this run chart, collect these outcomes pretty reliably in about 60% of visits over time. And I think this, this was in a really important first step. It allowed us to do a lot of research, to do population health management, to see you know, how our patients are doing, to study disparities, things like that. And you know, having um, a clear sense of what we wanted to do but couldn't do allowed us to then you know, work with uh, EPIC at a national level to try to build some of these rheumatology tools into the electronic health record. And I think this was really key. You know, the, the software developer has a lot more flexibility in terms of increasing the usability um, of, of the EHR. And so they were um, able to, over a few years, build you know, some of these tools for, for rheumatology and then, and then you know, put those into the foundation software. So now rheumatologists all across the United States, when they update Epic, can you know, have these tools at the ready. Um, so we love to count our sw swollen and tender joints. So they made this wonderful hom homunculus for us and they created these timelines so that we could track the outcomes that we really wanted to. But we still felt like you know, this wasn't quite you know, there yet. So it was, it was progress, but, but not enough. And so we got some funding to do some additional human-centered design work with clinicians and with patients to really try to take things uh, to the next level, um, try to understand, you know, how people are interacting with the EHR during rheumatoid arthritis visits, do design iterations, and really work in a multidisciplinary team. And, you know, I think one of the things that was very unique about this project is that patients were front and center. We sort of envision this future where the EHR is not just a documentation tool for doctors, but it's actually a tool that we use in clinic to share data with patients. And therefore, the input of patients was very important. And so, you know, we did lots of interviews and observations. This is, you know, classic sort of implementation stuff, lots of focus groups with patients and providers and then worked with the School of Medicine uh, uh, tech team uh, who were wonderful to do lots of designs uh, and prototypes. And you know, I think the, the patient focus groups were especially fun. Uh, we you know, asked patients to share with us the data that they wanted to see. You know, if they, were, if they, they were the ones living with rheumatoid arthritis, what were, the, what were the outcomes that were important to them that they wanted to track over time? Um, and we asked them to sort of act out their ideal clinic visits. And we actually asked them to make their own dashboard. Like if they could you know, make, make a customized dashboard to follow the things that they wanted to do, what would it look like? Um, and then you know, with that information, we started to construct you know, what we wanted uh, the EHR to be able to display uh, in, in uh, these RA clinic visits. And you can see here that um, uh, this is just an example. Um, of following uh, RA symptoms over time. So behind this is the disease activity scores that rheumatologists like to follow and the tender and swollen joint counts, um, uh, patient reported outcomes regarding function and pain, and all of this tracked against medication changes. And then of course, um, laboratories, which help us follow side effects of medications. So with this as a background, um, my colleague, Gabby Shmayuk, uh, was able to get a R01 uh, from, uh, from ARC to uh, sort of take this to the next level to actually build an application uh, that we could put into the EHR. And I'm happy to say that uh, we um, have a Salesforce app that's complete uh, and sort of ready, ready to go. And our next step is really to perform a randomized controlled trial to see if this uh, improves usability and improves outcomes in rheumatoid arthritis. The launch of the app in Epic has been severely delayed, delayed just because of COVID-19 and the IT staff at the medical center really working on COVID related issues, but hopefully this trial uh, will be able to start soon. So what are my reflections um, on this journey that we've been on in, in rheumatoid arthritis? I think that this is a, a story of persistence um, it's hard to change the electronic health record. It's hard to do learning health system. 
uh, research. Um, it's been, you know, seven years since we, we began on this journey. And I think, you know, one of the things is for, for in, in our case is it's been really nice to do um, work at the local level with our local health system, but then also be able to interact with software developers at the national level um, in order to make uh, an impact. And, you know, I think people often say that change in healthcare is incremental. Um, and I think that's okay. You know, we uh, have a very clear vision of what we want. I feel confident that we have also engaged patients in this process. And I think the lessons that we've learned along the way puts us in a good position to incorporate new technology as it becomes available. Um, and so I think, you know, patience and persistence has, has really been key to this, to this research. So I'll stop there um, and I think we're gonna go on to, to Q&A now. Well, that was wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Janice. We do have a question that I think Dr. Stein is starting to answer in the Q and A window. Please feel free to put them up there. Um, uh, but I'll take the speak the kind of moderator's prerogative and maybe put one out, a question out for each of you. Um, kind of inherent in learning health system work is this tension between the ideas that we as researchers think is cool and the priorities that the health system thinks is are important. Um, what are your, do you have any uh, tips or experiences that kind of helped you figure out how to balance those two things or find the common ground? I mean, I'm a happy, happy to start. I think it is really hard. Um, and I don't feel like we, we've necessarily cracked that nut, but I think, you know, the health system signals pretty clearly, you know, what their priorities are and what measures they use to assess those priorities. And so I think for us, we have gone about that by trying to be sure that when we are studying uh, the questions of interest that we incorporate those outcomes. Um, uh, and so if we're going to show that something is working or not working, you know, doing it in relations to outcomes that the health system cares about is sort of, uh, I think, just a natural way to at least start that alignment. Thanks, Julia. I think I can, I can just add something uh, and it'll also answer the question in the chat, which is, what do you think motivated Epic to work with, with us on the rheumatology module? So um, some of the work that I didn't share today was our work to develop national quality measures in, in rheumatoid arthritis um, that entailed you know, standardized measurements of patient reported outcomes and disease activity scores. And sort of taking those through you know, a, a national endorsement project, getting them into actually federal payment programs so that um, you know, there's, there's sort of an accountability um, pay for performance program for, for rheumatologists. And I think because of those measures being in national programs, it gave us more leverage when we were working with EPIC um, to say, this is, you know, these are parts of rheumatology guidelines. They're nationally endorsed quality measures. It's absolutely essential that you, that you incorporate this into, into your software. So I think the quality measurement approach has been um, very uh, um, helpful for us. I'll emphasize that also, I know, because um, we also thought about when we went to hospital leadership with the FIX project, with the sort of gathering patient um, feedback and observations, we, the co-design process, just to articulate, it wasn't just with family advisory. You, you do absolutely want to go and talk to your leadership, organizational leadership, make sure that they agree that it's aligned with their priorities um, and, you know, that there's a legal review if there's something that might come up legally. Um, and the thing that does really help is that because HCAPs, um, performance is a publicly reported and financially incentivized external um, quality measure. That meant that there was more alignment with organizational priorities as well for our project. So um, I think thinking about your external environment in addition to your internal environment can always be helpful. Even if the internal leadership might not be thinking about the external environment, you can point that out to people. So um, I think that's, a, 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 it echoes what Janus is highlighting and I think a helpful lesson learned. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe add, well, I'm sorry, go ahead, Annie. Go ahead, Mike, finish up. Go ahead. Yeah, I would almost say like one, one of the ways I sort of think about it is almost like a, like a, it's like a two by two diagram where, uh, where like one axis is what's important and another axis is what's important to the healthcare system. And ideally you want things that come kind of the top left corner, right? They're important, they're really important. You feel passionate about them and the healthcare system cares about them. There are other things which are really important, which can be really important to really valuable to study, even if it's not on the healthcare system's radar, because for example, it's not affecting their bottom line or their kind of readmission rates. Um, but uh, you know, there is a really important room for, for those kind of research as well. What you really don't want to do is kind of get into that bottom right corner where no one really thinks it's important 
including the healthcare system. And really kind of just being clear where you are on that axis is important, not only to help you decide whether or not this research is important to pursue, but what kind of stakeholders you need to engage and when, so you can actually take the research and do something with it. Uh, thanks, Mike. I think the related question is the, the, the third uh, partner in this is the funders who have a, yet a different set of priorities. One of our uh, attendees asks about whether anybody's figured a way to use the opportunism that comes with, with following the NIH RFA releases every Friday and lining those up with what you see as the needs in your research and needs for the health system. Any tips or experiences there would be useful. Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll hop in, I think, and maybe I'll speak for Janus actually, because I know that um, thinking about quality measurement is an important piece for HRQ, you know, always looking at what, you know, what, what a funder is, what, what their sort of priorities are. Um, uh, can always help figure out how to pitch your, your funding um, mechanism. Uh, I know for me, the NICHD is funding the, the R01 for the family um, and patient observations, and they, it's not actually historically something that really falls into their, um, their portfolio, but this particular project, I reached out to the program officer and it, it ended up um, that they also had a very specific call for sort of a learning health systems um, a set of projects they had a notice of interest and so that mm -hmm. that helped so paying attention to the signaling from any given funders even if you think they might not actually necessarily historically be interested in it it's still helpful to be sort of watching um what what uh what is coming out and um and so one very nitty-gritty thing which you guys might already know about but there's a a um email that you can uh, that you can sign up for to get a weekly summary of what all of the federal agencies are looking for in terms of new R01 um, RFAs that they're putting out, notice of interest, et cetera. And then just maybe a note that, you know, observational <laughs> research, right, is like just a fundamentally easier uh, because you're not actually asking much of the health system or maybe nothing. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, I think just thinking really carefully about where you want to push for doing some kind of, you know, intervention or work that involves changing the EHR or something else that really does require health system buy-in and involvement and where you can actually make significant progress and address a funder's priority with a really well-designed observational study. Thank you. Um, and maybe, uh, sorry, Mike, did you have a comment? Okay, great. Um, uh, maybe our last question before we wrap up is, is just a question about uh, how, uh, whether we, uh, we have any best practices for bringing in voices uh, from patients and communities when you're doing uh, human-centered design of your intervention. So like Naomi did some that, Janice, you definitely did, but any thoughts uh, for, the, for the audience to hear? Um, I'll say uh, sort of a lessons lessons learned. Um, uh, so there will be some health systems that already have a family advisory council or a patient advisory council, or we had like an adolescent uh, advisory council that was already um, standing up at um, Benioff Children's Hospital, San Francisco. Um, and so we already had a structure we could go and, and get feedback there. Um, that that structure is not as robust at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, not for lack of good intention or lack of trying, um, but I think it's really important uh, because they serve a much more socially vulnerable um, a set of patients, it's much harder for a family member or, you know, either an adult patient or, a, or particularly a family member with a kid at home, particularly a kid who might have gotten hospitalized for some reason, for them to be able to say, oh, I can take some time and come to a meeting or, you know, I'll be able to get a babysitter to, to um, uh, you know, take care of my kid and, uh, and I can commit to something monthly. So I think the issues around inequity of patient voice are actually really important. So some of the things that that um, people talk about, whether it's RWJ or HRQ or um, folks, is making sure that you really think through the funding piece of being able to provide childcare, provide translation, make sure that you really allow for accessibility for patient voice, particularly in socially vulnerable um, uh, communities. You don't just kind of rely on people to be like, oh yeah, sure, I can do it, because you're gonna get um, either, you're, you won't be able to organize it or you'll get a kind of, funky biased sample of people who are able to say yes to that. The one other thing I'll add there, I think it's really important is that the perfect is the enemy of the good here. I think a lot of people can be really intimidated. Oh my God, I need to get a patient advisory council. I need to have stakeholder engagement groups. I have no idea how to do that. So I'm just gonna like, just ignore it. And 
um, having something just like just getting started and starting to go to that path, you know, gets you a pretty far away there. So you can figure it out as you go along, but just don't be intimidated and feel like it's, it's, it's too far away to even try to approach. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add one other thing, which is, um, that's a great point. Uh, we also are doing usability testing on the unit. So that means that we actually walk into the unit and talk to the families and patients and show them our thing and talk it through with them um, in real time. So then they're already sort of in the hospital. They're, you know, quote unquote, a captive audience. And so then um, there's another way of getting that feedback rather than doing a, a large structure of a patient advisory council. So that's just one other pathway to potentially consider. Well, Thank you. This has really been a, a, a wonderful, wonderful hour. I've learned a, a lot from you all. We have a minute left. So I just want to thank you uh, again uh, and just remind the group that um, this is the second to last in this series. We'll have in another series from the IHPS uh, on next Wednesday at noon. That will be on focus on healthcare value, which is talking about accelerating research on value at UCSF and beyond. Uh, George Sawaya from UCSF and, and Kat Lau, Tracy Lynn, Leslie Wilson will be on that seminar as well. Uh, so mark your calendars now um, uh, for that. And then also mark your calendars for the monthly health policy grand rounds starting on the March 24th at noon. Uh, again, we'll send those invi invites around separately. Uh, but again, thanks to Janus. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi. Uh, and thank you so much. And please stay in touch with HPS.